um, donating her time and her expertise to uh, bring people to understand the issues uh, of food, healthy food, the ecology, the globe, and, um, and everything that we face right here at Ground Zero in Iowa. 50 years ago, Francis Moore LePay showed us the dangers of industrial meat production. Now those dangers have multiplied exponentially with confined animal feeding operations producing chicken, eggs, pork, turkey, and feedlots producing beef that are wrecking our local economies, our ecology, and our health. While Ms. LePay is most well known for her groundbreaking book, Diet for a Small Planet, she never stopped her activism, founding three nonprofits, including Food First and the Small Planet Institute, and authoring 16 more books. And I, I understand today she's working on yet another one. And as a special treat to everybody who joined here today, we have uh, Frances Moore LePay's permission to call her what her friends call her all the time, Frankie. So join me in welcoming Frankie, who's going to read a little bit and then we'll take uh, and then we'll have a conversation. Thank you so much, Susan. I'm absolutely thrilled, thrilled to be with you. I want you to know that I kind of have adopted uh, Iowa roots because my beloved partner of 22 years grew up in Clarinda. Do you know where Clarinda is? And uh, I've been there. <laughs> so uh, I, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about uh, how I began 50 years ago. It will be next year. Well, 50 years oh. ago exactly is when I sat down in the library asking the question, is there really not enough food in the world? So I, I want to take you back there and then I'm going to break and read a little passage from Diet for Small Planet and then just share a little bit about my key focus right now, which your work is absolutely central. So uh, yes, I was a lost 26 year old in the sense that I'd been an organizer in the war on poverty in Philadelphia and really, really wanted to go to the roots of the suffering that I saw. And so I left a graduate program the next year, probably the best decision I ever made, and just went to the library and said, well, gosh, food, that seems so basic. If people aren't eating, does anything else matter? And we were being told then by books like The Population Bomb, those I'm 76 people in my generation, you may remember, The Population Bomb uh, told us that famine was inevitable and it was right around the corner. The books Famine 1975 came out in the late 60s. So it was a terrifying time of fear and that fear then led to this scarcity fixation that there just was not enough. So I went to the Atlag Agricultural Library at UC Berkeley with a friendly librarian who walked me from shelf to shelf. And I soon learned that, well, wait a minute, there is more than enough food to feed all of us well if people had access to it. And of course that is even more true today. Numbers of calories per capita throughout the world, it's now about 2,900 calories uh, produced for each of us in the US is 37 hundred calories, which is vastly more than we need. So I, I really wanted to enable people to see that the real root of the hunger and agricultural crisis had to do with power. Who is empowered to make decisions in whose interests? In other words, about democracy or lack of it. And so that was really uh, the framing that led me to right diet. And the the real shocker for me was the way that we had built, what I first noticed was how we had built a system that actually greatly reduced the available food because so much of it was fed to livestock. That was the first way that I thought about how there is plenty of food that is it's crazy to think about scarcity. So I just wanted to though read to you a passage this is from the 1975 edition. And I, I just, because for me, a food became this very personal tool for empowerment. And so I said here, a change in diet is not an answer. A change in diet is a way of experiencing more of the real world instead of living in the illusory world created by our economic system, where our food resources are actively reduced and where food is treated as just another commodity. A change in diet is a way of saying simply, I have a choice, I have power. That is the first step for how can we take responsibility for the future unless we can make choices now that take us personally off the destructive path 
that has been set for us by our forebears. And so that's always been my theme that we know always that if we choose something based on our own knowledge and experience, then we feel more aligned, more uh, powerful to ourselves, you know, more convincing. And then I believe we become more convincing to others. And so that's why I think these very personal choices matter, even aside from their ripples effect into the economic system. So I, I just wanted to say now, I uh, really want to listen to your questions, but right now I'm obsessed <laughs> uh, with uh, writing the 50th anniversary edition. Um, I'm, two things I've got on my plate right now. I'm writing a book for feedback only. We're going to put it on, the, on our website at smallplanet.org. And it is called, It's Not Too Late. And the subtitle is Crisis, Opportunity, and the Power of Hope. And the longest chapter is the chapter on food and agriculture. Um, and um, basically the, sub, the title of that chapter I'm, I'm still playing with is called From Climate Culprit to Climate Cure, that our food and ag choices have contributed, do contribute to the problem, but are central to solutions to the problem of climate. So I would love it if you would just make a note and, and uh, make sure that you can just email smallplanet.org and uh, excuse me, info at smallplanet.org and make sure you see that PDF, which is going to be up there in a few weeks. And it's called, It's Not Too Late. And chapter five is the chapter on food and agriculture. And I'd love your feedback because I love doing the book this way because we're saying, please give us feedback. And then after the election in 2021, we'll take all that feedback and turn it into a book. I did that once before with the book and it worked great. So for the 50th anniversary, um, I'm, I'm uh, so, what's so different now is that uh, so many, in, you know, credible bodies like uh, Lancet, many of you are no doubt aware of the Lancet issue that was focused on food and very much saying that uh, eating a more plant-centered whole foods diet is um, the way uh, to better health for ourselves and the earth. And, uh, and also, there is more and more evidence of how the extreme economic inequity that reflects our broken democracy must be a part of the solution. So the last chapter in my new book and even more, it will be clear in the new diet for small planet, the 50th anniversary edition of small planet is that I think that we all have to learn as one friend put it to me. He said, Frankie, when I was saying, ah, food, democracy, food, democracy, he said, you know, where do I focus my energies? He said, Frankie, you know you can love two children at once. And I said, oh yes, I have two children, I do that. So um, I, I, what I wanna do for the rest of my life is not feel that tension between my involvement in the food movement and my involvement in the democracy movement, but they just really connect. And so at the last chapter, chapter six of the new It's Not Too Late book forthcoming, uh, I really embrace the democracy movement of movements. I think it's the first time in history where uh, food movement organizations, Food and Water Watch is one of the activists in this, uh, but many um, across racial justice, across environment, um, economic justice, people are coming together in a movement of movements. And uh, so we are putting, we at Small Planet are also creating a website called democracymovement.us so that you can see that it's part of our food <laughs> obligation as food growers and food eaters to also weigh in to fix our broken democracy. So um, that is something of an introduction um, that democracymovement.us website will launch in, in August. And so be sure you'll be in touch with us for the release of It's Not Too Late and the release of this new it will be a, what do they call it, a soft launch in August. So I just want to tell you again how much I admire your work and how much I want to do a shout out for your work in my new book, if I possibly can. <laughs> and um, in any case, I'm very happy to be with you today because it's lonely for all of us right now. So thank you for inviting me. And again, thank you for all that you contribute that I can share with the world. In a recent article in the Boston Globe, you outlined how retaking our democracy is necessary to addressing climate change and thus food insecurity. Please expand on this idea. And this is from our board, uh, board member, Mary Ellen Miller. 
Well, I think uh, a lot of Americans get it. In fact, the polls show that something like over 80% of us realize that money has too much power in our decision making. And I think so many people in the farm in the world of farming see how uh, the policy is geared toward rewarding those at the very top. I was just looking at farm subsidies today, how much of them are focused on the very, very top. I also just heard the statistic this morning, my partner told me that it was on NPR, I guess, that 80% of tax cuts um, under President Bush have gone to the top 1%. So in a, in a, in a compromised democracy, I call it privately held government, which is not a good thing, where money has more power than citizens' voices. And in my book, Daring Democracy, that I wrote with a millennial that came out in 2017, after a long march for democracy reforms uh, in 2016, that the what's so fantastic is that um, there is now a movement to limit the power of money in politics. That John Sarbanes is the one of the key leaders, and if we elect a new president, there is a bill waiting that would do so much in one bill to uh, remove the power of money and uh, prevent gerrymandering and prevent voter suppression, all of those things um, that leading to the elite uh, control. So um, I, I just feel like, um, let me quote Franklin Roosevelt in answering that question. He said to a joint session in Cong of Congress, in 1938, he said, the liberty of democracy is not safe if the people tolerate the growth of private power to the point that it is stronger than the democratic state itself, that in its essence is fascism. Now I joke that I only use the F word when I'm quoting an American president. We can't really use that word very easily here, but that names it for me. So this, this movement for democracy uh, is essential in all realms uh, we've seen just another figure um, uh, that uh, over the last decades, I've forgotten exact decades, but the, the, the income gains of the top 1% in the U.S. have been increasing 100 times faster than the bottom. Um, I'm sorry, I'm kind of fuzzy on that, but I think it's the bottom 90%, uh, maybe the bottom 50%. So it, it is really getting worse and worse. So I, I just feel like we, it's, it's all connected and that's what we learn as we learn about ecosystems, right? And, uh, we, and you work with the ecosystem, it's all connected. And I guess that's the best way I can answer the question. The next question is the one I know we just got into right before we got online here, but um, the question is, can pastured raised Pasture-raised meat, dairy, and eggs be part of a small diet for a small planet. And well, that's from Mike Carberry. Mm -hmm. Yes, I. It. We were just Susan and I and uh, Christina. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were just talking about this um, because there is a new study. There are new studies out, and I. I just been trying to get my head around this saying, and I just can't believe it's true. But it is in peer-reviewed journals now. It's out there. You should know that pasture-raised beef is three times more uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions per unit of product produced. It's three times worse. And I, I said, no, 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 this, I, I just, come on already. This just doesn't make sense to me. So uh, I, I, um, I reached out to a scientist today who said he would help me understand it um, because I, these peer reviewed studies, who knows? I, I just, I lose it. I just can't, it's just so counterintuitive to me. So I've always believed, as Susan was saying, that of course, you know, for people who are farming in such a way that animals are integrated in positive ways into our ecosystem, that all is part of a sane and, and healthy environment. Um, and and I, I think I say, and I think I've always said in Diet for a Small Planet that I'm not saying that everyone should become a vegetarian, even though I, I, I am a vegetarian, but I call myself a plant-centered eater, you know, plant and planet-centered, but that's a personal choice. It's, it's not uh, against people who, it's not saying it's not appropriate to eat ecologically raised animal foods. So I leave that to the individual, of course, you know. Um, 
So I don't know if that answers your question, but I just want to alert all of you that that is really out there in peer reviewed literature now. And if any of you um, have insights about it, uh, I would love your uh, help in trying to, to grapple with that literature. Um, and I could share with you some of the peer reviewed papers that I saw that were making this claim. I hope someone will jump in here. Um, my experience was in Pennsylvania when we were working for an independent newspaper, we were running an independent newspaper, and we ran an article against uh, Monsanto's product, Posilac, which uh, was the artificial growth hormone for, um, for cows. And uh, the opposition argument, and one guy used to say, for every PhD, there's an equal and opposite PhD. Um, so, you know, one of the arguments was, no, 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 pastured cows, you know, and, and not using this is much worse for the planet because we'll need that many more acres and uh, to put the cows on and it'll eat up that much more land and, you know, all this. So it would be interesting, especially to hear from some of our academics on the call about what you, if you've heard about that. The next question is, what kind of future do you see for plant-based plant meats, so-called meats in our diet? I recently had a Beyond Meat burger, quote unquote, and it was tasty, but costly and entailed too much packaging. Exactly, processing and packaging and who knows what. My daughter has a great piece on it. I've forgotten the title, but if you, if if you Google Anna LaPay and, um, you know, one of these terms, uh, fake meat terms. Yeah, I mean, she really has a really good critique of it. And it, again, it's more, what we don't need is more processing and more pricing based on adding costs. And I, I, I just think it's not the way to go. Uh, you, we have another not to question. Mention, excuse me, not to mention the concentration of power in our economy that that can, that would, I think I'm sure it would lead to even more of. Uh, you mentioned we produce enough food. People are still convinced the growing population is the problem. How should we address this? Well, that's never been true. Um, actually, the only part of the world where the population is still growing at all, uh, it really is, I mean, much of the world is now below replacement, uh, is in Sub-Saharan Africa and in a few states in India. And that is, <laughs> uh, population experts will tell us, that is because of the disempowerment of women, that women's voices aren't heard in those cultures. So the solution is empowerment of women. And uh, again, uh, much of the world is already at replacement or below replacement. So population is growing slowly. And um, that uh, I think the answer again is <laughs> more democracy with women's voices. So I, I I, there, we, we have so much more supply than we need today, and we are wasting so much. I'm sure you've all heard that figure about thir a third of all food is wasted. And I, this comparison is also very striking, that if food waste were a, its own country, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world. So eliminating waste is good for supply, of course, and for reducing climate impact. And we know that so much of waste is not just what's thrown away in the industrial world because poor farmers sometimes you know, lack capacity to get their stuff to market. And, and that's about poverty and in lack of empowerment through their own country's political systems. It's not a failure of the, you know, it's not a battle with the earth. <laughs> it's, it's us getting it together, right? So I just think the more we can just say, wait a minute, this is not a natural limit. This is a crisis that we are creating and uh, we can change it. And as women become more empowered, I mean, if you look at Indian states in India where women are organized in women's groups and that sort of thing, guess what? <laughs> Birth rate is very much lower. So we know what works. This man-made sense of scarcity and, and of poverty, this is what we address at still in terms of land. Everyone thinks of land as the thing that appreciates in value over time, so it's a great investment. But what it creates is land speculation that now drives young and new farmers, small farmers, out of the entire industry because the, of the land cost. And so we're kind of challenging, we are challenging at SIL, this notion that land is more valuable than the food it can grow or the use that it has, as opposed, you know, right. so we're not, we're no longer letting farmland 
grows healthy food compete with housing developments and commercial uh, agriculture, at least uh, conventional commercial. So we understand this sense of uh, man-made crises. Um, yes. So we have some sources for you. One from our friends, uh, Cornelia and Jan Flora, who are also health founders. Um, the difference with pasture-raised beef is that they are not as densely packed and help make the soil more able to absorb greenhouse gases. The other is that a lot of pasture-raised beef is in wooded areas. And then one more uh, is Russ Konzer of bluenestbeef.com is a good resource on the value of rotational grazing for soil regeneration and carbon sequestration. Mm -hmm. And I have right. to throw this in, Denise O'Brien, uh, along with Fred Kirschman and the Flores and a few other of our Iowa celebrities here. She writes in, hello from hot Southern Iowa, Frankie. I would like to know how you keep energized and keep fighting the fight. This is a question I often have for Denise, by the way. Um, your influence on my life has been more impactful, starting with Diet for a Small Planet to the books co-authored with Anna. Uh, thank you so very much. Oh, well. Uh it's all the work that you all are doing. It's feeling, I'm gonna start getting teary here, but it really is feeling like we are all connected. And I think that the food and farming piece of this incredible puzzle um, is, is so essential. It can, you know, it's that um, I'm just, I guess I, I just feel so, motivated to share just to share because i feel like if people could just know what you all know that they would really not feel so discouraged i was just told that there was a radio program just moments before we went on that said americans are losing faith in democracy and that's just frightening and what um my motivation is is to fight despair and i think that's what you are doing by your actions and by um, sharing what you're learning. So that's what keeps me going is people like you. <laughs> so thank you. We have um, from Kristen, thank you for your vision, clarity in communicating and the important connections you help people understand. I know your work on democracy and being a possibilist from the Pachamama oh. Alliance. Oh yes. Wow. Yes. Um, Thank you, I, that you give me the opportunity to repeat my theme song of my life, that um, I'm not an optimist, I'm not a pessimist, but because you've helped teach me and I live within this relational world where everything is connected, everything is a continuous change, and so we're all co-creating, then it is simply not possible to know what's possible. And if it's not possible to know what's possible, then we are totally free to go for the world we want because nobody can say it's impossible until we try. So that's why, yes, I call myself a possibilist. And uh, it's very, very helpful because I think it's very hard to be optimistic like Rosie right now. But uh, if you live in an ecological worldview, then possibilism is possible. <laughs> Um, we have a note here thanking you also from Iowa City, Roxanne Mitten, saying you, you changed her life with your book. Um, I'm sure we have a lot of those. I've, I've heard many people say that. Um, she says, uh, your book was a primary guide in my college years, 1978 and beyond. Oh, wow. um, we also have uh, Timothy Weiss, who I'm, uh, is, is associated <laughs> with the Small Planet Institute, right? In yes. his book, Eating Tomorrow, posits that we have the capacity to feed ourselves via local food production. He says 70% of today's population is fed this way via local farmers who understand their soils and climate. Uh, do you see a global return to more local farming? Thank you. Yes, Tim's book, Eating Tomorrow, is fantastic. And I highly recommend it for all of you. And I do. I don't have any quantifications, but I think... Uh, the stories that you tell and um, that, um, you know, just yesterday I was on a, a video call with the Boston Globe with a lot of local people and the uh, CSA movement, for example, uh, community sorted agriculture is really growing. And uh, I think that COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic is, is actually encouraging that. If people don't want to go to supermarkets, they want to just buy the local local if they can. So I do see that very, very much. And uh, if you have suggestions on how to get that 
more emphasized in the new book. Um, I would really appreciate your feedback. I think some of our farmers here, like Denise and others, might, I don't know, might say that this uh, we're outgrowing the CSA model and it's time to look for that ag of the middle, the yeah. smaller institutions in our communities that we can sell to. And, um, and, and I think I, I count on the millennial generation and the younger people to be rebuilding that local food system so that while we secure the land, they're re rebuilding the movement, the, the uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. at least here in Iowa, because it's been very hard. It's a lot of miles between cities here, and uh, it's a lot of work to rebuild all the distribution that we let atrophy on our, in our generation, I, I'd say. Um, yeah, I would encourage any of you who, if there, you have thoughts on such as this, I, I, I don't have a lot to say about it in this It's Not Too Late book, but if you wanted to email me, info at small planet, and, and push me and give me some you know, more uh, on any of these things we're talking about, if there's any thoughts you have that you think from what I've said that I'm not getting it straight or I need more grounding, uh, any ideas you have, I'm really open right now. I haven't finished it yet. It will be up for review in a couple of weeks, but um, anything, you know, I'm just eager, you're the doers. So uh, any hunch you have about something I might not know enough about and you do, don't hesitate to email me. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to close it out here and please do write to Frankie at, and you get to call her Frankie uh, just because you showed up today <laughs> at uh, info at smallplanet.org. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And uh, I just want to thank you again so much. This, uh, last year we packed the house with Raj Patel at the Angler Theater in, uh, in Iowa City. And oh, good, you know, good, good, good. It's not the thing to do these days. So it's such a treat to have you join us here in Iowa without having to jump on a plane. Um, now, I just want to remind everyone else, Frankie donated her time today. So, uh, and you know, she's running a nonprofit. She's, that's not something you usually do when you're trying to raise money for your nonprofit. So uh, we are asking you today, and she did that because we can't hold our own fundraisers right now and we don't have a lot of cash flow. So we're going to ask you now to support her Small Planet Institute today with a donation so that she understands um, that we're all in this together and connected and that we get that too. Um, and please just remember, if you know rural, rural Iowa landowners, send them to the silt.org to see our silt solution. We can divide, diversify Iowa's landscape, clean our water and air, provide new opportunities for young healthy food farmers and new farmers on our rural landscape with permanently protected sustainable food farms that are affordable. That's the equation we're working on, taking the land speculation out of the equation for future farmers. So thank you all so much for coming and we had a great turnout today and uh, please do donate to the Small Planet Institute today if you can. Thanks everyone, thank you Frankie. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for all your hard work, for all you do for us. Be well. <laughs>